Do you ever feel overwhelmed by the ever-changing world of technology? Tech It Out can help make some sense of it all. Breaking down geek speak into street speak, technology columnist, author, and TV personality Mark Saltzman covers consumer technology each week for every listener. Mark tackles the latest news, reviews, and how-tos to help you understand what's hot, what's not, and why. Welcome, everyone, to Tech It Out. This is episode 231. Hope you're all doing great as we're wrapping up the first month of 2022. Wow, that was fast, huh? Regardless, I hope you're doing well and staying healthy. And hey, we have a fantastic Tech It Out show planned for you this hour, beginning with a chat about the word game sensation taking over the planet called Wordle. Even if you haven't played this free-to-play and daily game, no doubt you've seen those little green and yellow squares all over your social media feeds and wondering what it's all about. So we're going to chat with Dan Ackerman from CNET shortly about that. After that interview, Super Bowl is coming up, of course, in a couple of weeks, and we're going to chat about a new invention, the Captain Morgan Super Bowl Punch Bowl, which has a high-tech twist. We're going to talk with the inventor, Maddie Benedetto, who runs the very popular website and social media channel, Unnecessary Inventions, which has more than 7 million followers. After that, on the back half of the show, IBM talks about the future of shopping. And to top it all off this week, we're going to chat with an actual hacker about what he does and why and how they're not all bad. Despite what you might think, we're going to learn about an ethical hacker later this hour with Ben Sadegapur, who goes by the handle Nahamsek. All of this and more on an all-new Tech It Out, powered by Asus for those in search of Incredible. I'll tell you more about Asus shortly, but let's officially kick off a fresh new Tech It Out with our first interview. If you haven't yet played Wordle, no doubt you've seen these little green and yellow squares all over your social media feeds over the past few weeks. To explain what the word game sensation is all about, and it is huge, we're joined by Dan Ackerman, Editorial Director for Computers and Gaming at CNET.com, one of the most popular news and review sites about tech. And Dan also knows a thing or two about gaming sensations as he authored the 2016 book, The Tetris Effect, the game that hypnotized the world. Hi, Dan. Good to chat with you again. Good talking to you, Mark. Now, before we talk Wordle, tell us a bit about your time at CNET and your other work as well. Ah, it's so interesting. It's been a long time. I think I've been there 16 years now, which is pretty common for CNET people because we all tend to be real subject matter experts. And it's just a great place to do in-depth testing and benchmarking. And I think that's why, why everyone tends to stay there a long time, because it just gives us this outlet to tell people about the stuff that we know and we've learned about over the years. Awesome. And I've seen you on like CBS This Morning. I know you have your own website. I think you were part of a a board game. You've authored that Tetris book got some side hustles as well. You know, everyone's got to have a side hustle, but I also try to you know, share the knowledge far and wide. And I'm very excited to finally get back into going in studio for like TV appearances and, sure. and interviews and stuff, which you and I both know have been, has been almost entirely remote for the last two years. So look, everyone's talking about Wordle. What is this game all about? It's so interesting. It's this little viral sensation that popped up and in the best viral way, it's completely non-commercial. It's not something a big company cooked up to Mm -hmm. try to get people hooked. It's just a little word game a guy made for uh, a friend of his. And uh, it's on a web browser. It's browser-based. It's not an app. It's not a game you buy somewhere. Mm -hmm. And he just puts up one word a day that you have to guess. And there's, you know, rules about guessing the letters and which ones are in the right place and wrong place. And it's just the simplest thing. And I think people liked it because it wasn't trying to sell you anything. It wasn't trying to get you to sign up for a newsletter. It was just just a thing that was a thing. And at any company, if you had a, a project like this that was popular and did well, you would get immediate pressure to monetize it or turn it into an NFT or something. And, and <laughs> this is not happening with Wordle. And I think that's why it's so awesome. Right. And of course, NFT is non-fungible tokens. This is uh, using a cryptocurrency to buy a digital asset. But you're right. You don't need to sign up to play. It's free. There's no ads. I mean, it's just such a a fun game. But let's break it down for our listeners who may have seen those green and yellow squares, but they don't get it. So as you said, there's one word a day that you need to guess. And there's a little keyboard at the bottom. Or if you are playing on a computer, you can use the actual keyboard. You have six tries to guess that word. So walk us through 
through the mechanics. It's kind of like Wheel of Fortune meets Mastermind, if that's fair. It really is Wheel of Fortune. Like that, that is a great description. It's a five letter word every day. And they promise it's a common word, not a super obscure one. And you just have five faces across and six rows down. So you just type in any five letter word to start. And it tells you if you got any letters that are correct and in the right place that turns the square green, or if they're the correct letter, but in the wrong place, then that square is yellow. And then you use that information on each subsequent guess to get closer and closer mm -hmm. to the word. Right. So with, and I think it was called mastermind. It was with colors and by process of elimination, you will try to guess that word and hopefully get it within six tries. And that's really the fun with Wordle. How much do you think, Dan, the appeal is to share your score on social media when you're done? Talk us through that part of the game. That's really interesting. That's something that got added a little later on in the game's uh, life cycle, at first there was no way to share your score because it really wasn't meant even for public consumption. Uh, so people were basically just posting their score just manually. So the guy who created the game said, all right, I'm going to put a simple shareable uh, tool in there. So you hit share, you put it on Twitter or wherever, and it shows you uh, the squares, where the, the gray and the yellow and the green, but doesn't give away what the actual word of the letters are. It's spoiler free, but it's a way to brag you know, that you got it within six tries or less. Frankly, I find through process of elimination, after you go through a few rows, there's really only one or two words left that will meet <laughs> the requirements. You just have to figure out what that word is and really plumb the depths of your vocabulary. Have you gotten it on a single try or maybe two tries? You know what? Yesterday... I got it on the second try, first time ever, and I really just lucked into it. A couple of a couple of letters arranged themselves in a certain way. I was like Maybe it's this word. Uh, okay, fine. I tried it and boom, that was it. Since this is going to air uh, not the same day that the puzzle uh, uh, has posted. So let's, let's talk that through for a moment. All right. So yesterday's word was sugar, if I'm not mistaken. And I guessed pound, P-O-U-N-D. I got zero letters. So, uh, so I'm like, okay, I, there's got to be some vowels in there. So if it's not O-U in pound, maybe it's like U-A. Then you start playing it around. And that's where I came up with the word sugar. I used the letter S because it's a common letter. Is that kind of your process as you, you try to think of like Wheel of Fortune, some of the more common consonants and vowels? It's interesting. Some people have a starter word they use every time. Right. Some people use a handful of starter words. I think we've all figured out that much like Wheel of Fortune, you want to pick a word that has a bunch of the popular vowels and a bunch of the popular consonants in it. Mm -hmm. And that's a good place to start. If you use the same word every day, I'm sure there's some optimized word that is the absolute best word to use based <laughs> on how common different letters are. People get close. I, I used agile for a while, audio. For some reason, I seem to come up with A words as my yeah, starter I use, word. I use brain because it has oh, like that's a, a good N and A and an I, but I've used break, but B isn't as common. So I don't know why I'm using Yeah, you want to get an S in there or a T <laughs> right, maybe. Right. I just heard an interesting tip from somebody, and it's not really a tip that'll help you play the game better, but it's kind of fun. As your first word, use yesterday's answer. Oh, that's neat. It's that a five-letter word. Mm -hmm. I tried that this morning, and I got one letter correct, but in the wrong place, so it didn't really work yeah. out for me. <laughs> and sometimes you can get two letters in the same word. So a couple of days ago, it, the answer was Noel. K-N-O-L-L, -L, as in like grass. I remember that one. And it's like two L's. You're like, D ooh. And then last week, one of the words was robot. So two O's. So that can get tricky because you assume it's only going to be one instance of that letter per word. Yeah, that's what you got to watch out for. I've seen several cases where they double up on a letter. And even if you have a green box, which means the letter is in the right place and it's the right letter, that letter could also be later on in there. And you wouldn't know that unless you tried it. We are chatting with Dan Ackerman. He is the editorial director for computers and gaming at CNET.com. He's authored the book, The Tetris Effect. You can sign up for his newsletter, which we'll plug a little bit later called The Big Ack. But we are chatting about Wordle, this uh, game phenomenon that's free to play every day. And uh, it has a social component as well. So you've walked us through a couple of tips. Any other tips on beating the game? I think having having a vocabulary of good starter words with good vowels in it is definitely key. You want to eliminate the A and the E fairly early on, or make sure they're included, because I think those are probably very, very, very common. Don't go to the thesaurus. It's not going to be a really obscure word. Great tips there. Okay, so I plugged your book, The Tetris Effect, the game that hypnotized the world. Do you think Wordle has the potential of being this generation's Tetris or not even close? It's interesting. Wordle fits something that we need. It's the right game for right now. It's what we, I think, as a society need because it is a shared experience that we can derive a certain amount of kind of social utility from. And it's what I call a remote 
asynchronous experience, which means we're not doing it at the same time or in the same place, mm -hmm. but we are sharing the experience. And I think the social media sharing of the scores is a big part of that. It's something that's not cynical. It's not negative. It's just a nice little thing we can all share. And I'm already starting to see the wordle backlash on Twitter where people are complaining about too many people posting their scores. <laughs> and it's just like, don't be that guy. Don't be the curmudgeon. Let's just, let's just have a nice thing we can all feel good about for a few minutes a day. <laughs> and when you post your progress for the day and you see the different colored uh, squares, it doesn't even plug where to play the website. So if you are interested, you're listening right now and you haven't played, just go to your favorite search engine and type in Wordle, W-O-R-D-L-E. The URL itself is powerlanguage.com co.uk slash or just type in wordle in a search engine you're gonna be able to find it and as we wrap up with you dan where's the best place to learn more about your work and and follow you on social and subscribe to your newsletter and all that good stuff awesome yeah at dan ackerman on twitter you can follow all my stuff on cnet and i occasionally put out a little digest of me and my team cnet stories uh you can sign up for that at dan ackerman.substack.com because everybody's got to be on substack these days <laughs> dan thanks so much for your time and good luck with wordle i'll be looking for your uh, scores over the coming days and weeks. All the best. Thank you. All right. Good talking to you. You are listening to Tech It Out. I'm your host, Mark Saltzman. This show is powered by Asus for those in search of incredible. Asus creates technology for today and tomorrow's smart life, including its line of award-winning laptops and desktops, accessories like monitors and mice and keyboards, smartphones, tablets, smartwatches, and much more. For those in search of incredible, visit asus.com slash us slash radio. When we return on Tech It Out, the Captain Morgan Super Bowl Punch Bowl invention. You're not going to want to miss this. Stick with us. We'll be right back. Listen to Tech It Out whenever you want. Find the Tech It Out podcast at iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back, everyone. You are listening to Tech It Out. Football fans may not know this, but the 2021-2022 season is the first time the NFL's open as sponsorship opportunities with Spirits Brands. And Captain Morgan is the first ever official spiced rum sponsor of the NFL. How cool is that? What does this have to do with tech, Mark, you're asking? Well, I'm thrilled to have on the show Matty Benedetto. He's, of course, an engineer, inventor, and founder of Unnecessary Inventions, an online platform with millions of followers. And he's here with us to chat about a unique Super Bowl punch bowl that he had a hand in creating. Hi, Maddie. Good to chat with you. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, before we talk about the Captain Morgan Super Bowl punch bowl, tell us about yourself and your work with Unnecessary Inventions. It's a website, of course, at unnecessaryinventions.com, and you have a huge social media presence as well. Yeah, so uh, Unnecessary will be just about three years old in a month. And over that time, I've built, designed, prototyped, and filmed over 300 different inventions. And my tagline is sort of, I design products to solve problems that don't exist. <laughs> That's awesome. And I have a massive, a little over 7 million followers in that time. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah, I've watched a bunch of your uh, videos. What are some of your favorites that you've done? I would say some of my favorite ones in the past. I made a pair of, they're called selfie sandals. So picture a classic pair of flip flops, but in the top, there's a little compartment to put your phone in. So if you don't have a selfie stick around, you basically can turn your leg into a selfie stick by <laughs> kicking your leg fully up in the air and getting the perfect selfie with your leg kind of looking back at you as a selfie stick. That's awesome. But again, for those who aren't familiar with unnecessary inventions, it's not just about how crazy these are, but you have such a great on-camera presence, right? Your persona is amazing and really entertaining. So kudos once again. Talk to us about the Captain Morgan Super Bowl Punch Bowl, which is billed as, quote unquote, the most high-tech, amazingly ridiculous gadget engineered specifically to spice up the Super Bowl. Tell us about it. Yeah, so uh, Captain Morgan uh, came to me uh, a couple months ago with this idea, and I was really drawn to it because, you know, whenever I'm designing my inventions, I want people to look at it, and the first thing, they're like, wait, that's so ridiculous. And then immediately you're thinking, oh, my God, I need that yeah, right away. Yeah, take my money, right. Right, and that was sort of exactly, <laughs> you know, what this punch bowl was. You know, it has so many features 
but at the same time you're like oh wait i could actually kind of use that so it's got leds that actually like interact with the game so anytime there's like a touchdown or a first down they're going to light up different colors also the subwoofer inside of the punch bowl has a speaker so then the subwoofer can also mix up all of the punch inside you know and it can serve up to i think 32 people oh, it's wow. 18 inches 18 inches in diameter like this thing is a beast like it's if you have it at your party it's going to be certainly a statement <laughs> sounds like it all right so i'm a geek i'm a gadget geek a techie so it's got an integrated speaker with subwoofer as well yep. as a numerical sort of scoreboard so whenever your favorite team that's in the super bowl has a touchdown or field goal or something like that all the the numbers are shown in real time right i think one's orange one's green something like that Yep, exactly. Yeah, on the front and back, it has yeah. uh, has the uh, the live ticker on there. Awesome. What made you want to get involved in something like this? And I, I understand it's also part of a partnership with the uh, Super Bowl champ, Victor Cruz, right, from the New York Giants. Yep, and and that's actually, like, perfect. Um, so they they told me that he'd be working on the project as well. I enjoy football. I'm not, like, the biggest football fan. And that's sort of where Victor comes in. And I love sort of the atmosphere of the Super Bowl, of it just being, like, such a fun event. So kind of combining those two things of like diehard football fans and then diehard people that just kind of want to have fun at the Super Bowl, really spice things up. Um, so like kind of that mixture of the two things and then, you know, bringing in the whole unnecessary inventions world, sort of integrating this ridiculous still kind of necessary punch bowl uh, it just it just was like a perfect perfect match so it sounds like me where i like the chicken wings and some, right. you know some some alcoholic drinks so this is great and i like that more than the actual game yeah and you know with me making my inventions almost anything can you know inspire me to create something new so even if it's getting a whole bunch of fun people together i think at the super bowl is also really fun that i can like bounce new ideas like someone will be eating chicken wings and I'll be like, okay, now I need to make a pair of pants with paper towels built in because your hands get so messed up while eating chicken wings. So it's like just everything around it is really fun for me. We are chatting with Maddie Benedetto. He is an engineer, inventor, and founder of Unnecessary Inventions. And that's the website as well, unnecessaryinventions.com, where you can follow him on Insta and many other platforms. We're chatting about the Captain Morgan Super Bowl Punch Bowl. This is a high-tech punch bowl that Maddie had a hand in helping to create. Before we wrap up, Maddie, talk to us about how many of these there are and how one lucky fan of legal drinking age of course may win this gadget to spice up their super bowl party yep so there are only 20 of these super bowl punch bowls made in entire existence so one lucky person will get a chance to actually win one of these um, if you're 21 and over you can go to captainmorgan.com slash super bowl punch bowl from now until february 6th you can enter there for your chance to win you'll also win an invention that i made that kind of goes with the punch bowl it's this ladle that helps you sift out the ice so maybe you just need a a little bit of extra ice inside of your punch or maybe you need to need to have a little extra punch in your in your cup so it kind of helps you choose which one you're going to do and people almost never get their hands on my inventions like i love just sort of like dangling them in front of people so this is going to be like one of the only times that people will be able to take home one of my inventions this is obviously a radio interview a podcast chat but there is a six 60 second video people can see online, right? Is on YouTube? Yep. Uh, so Victor and I, we shot a very fun product commercial for the Super Bowl Punch Bowl. So you can go check that out online as well. Okay. Again, it's the Captain Morgan Super Bowl Punch Bowl. And we've been chatting with Maddie Benedetto. Hey, thanks so much for your time. Great to chat with you. And again, the website is captainmorgan.com slash Super Bowl Punch Bowl. Yep, that's correct. Have some fun and hope you get a chance to drink from this on February 13th. Be well. Thanks. Have a good one. Well, that was fun. When we return on Tech It Out, we're going to chat the future of shopping with IBM. Stick with us. We'll be right back. Want to follow Mark? Google him. Mark with a C and Saltzman with a Z. Breaking down geek speak into street speak. This is Tech It Out. Tech It Out. With technology columnist, author, and TV personality, Mark Saltzman. Welcome back to Tech It Out. The pandemic has impacted every aspect of our lives, let's face it, and that includes how we shop, on what has changed at retail and online, and what businesses need to do to adapt to these new consumer preferences. With the help of technology, of course, we're joined by Carl Haller, who leads IBM's Consumer Industry Center of Competency. Wow, what a title. Welcome to the show, Carl. Thanks for your time. Thanks for 
for having me on, Mark. Yes, just competency at this point. <laughs> All right. All kidding aside, why don't we just dive right in? How has the pandemic changed how consumers want to shop? So it's changed a fantastic amount. I'm sure as you and all your listeners have experienced, we're all shopping differently than we were two years ago. Um, We're changing how we shop, we're changing what we buy and how we spend our time and money. Um, We recently completed a uh, global study in conjunction with the National Retail Federation, which is the world's leading retail trade association of nearly 20,000 customers in 25 or 28 countries around the world. This is um, a biannual study we do. This one is entitled Consumer 2022, and it it just went live about a week ago. Um, And it's entitled Consumers Want It All, Hybrid Shopping, Sustainability, and Purpose-Driven Brands. Now, given the title, you won't be shocked to learn that one of those big takeaways is this emergence of what we call hybrid shopping. You know, for the past 20 years, we've had – this argument and discussion and this kind of um, dividing line between stores or what now get called brick and mortar or e-commerce, you know, websites, mobile devices, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Hybrid shopping combines both. It combines the digital and the physical. So maybe this is buying something online, but picking it up in store or picking it up curbside. Maybe it's shopping in the store and having something delivered to you um, or using a mobile app to buy something that gets shipped to your home over, you know, in two or three days. Mm-hmm. And this new way of shopping, which was virtually non-existent, you know, two, three years ago, is now the primary way of buying for more than one in four consumers around the world. Oh, wow. Didn't we used to call that omni-channel? You know, we've had, we've had a lot of names. Gosh, in my career, we've had cross-channel and multi-channel and omni-channel, and I think we'll probably have meta-channel soon. <laughs> um, yeah. Anymore, I just say it's, it's just shopping. Yeah, sure. It's just how consumers shop today. Yeah, and hybrid is, is the optimal word, as you said, as is sustainability, which you found in your report. Talk to us about the role that that plays in our shopping decisions and brand preferences, too. So I am very optimistic about um, our future in terms of sustainability, at least as it pertains to how consumers shop and behave. This was a key aspect of our study, and we're, we're finally at this point where sustainability is important to both consumers, you know, all of us who buy stuff, and to retailers and brands, you know, the companies who want to sell us stuff. We've had different periods in time where, you know, retailers and brands are interested, but consumers didn't care, and then consumers were interested and retailers and brands didn't care. And the fact that we're all in this together now means we're starting to see something happen, and we're getting close to the tipping point of having sustainability be something that's just part of how we behave instead of being something that, you know, is only for a few people or only for a few brands and stores. Mm -hmm. So uh, IBM, we've done, a, we've done a bunch of studies over the past 18 months of both consumers and business executives. This was a key piece of our Consumer 2022 study, um, and specifically we found a couple of things. One, almost two-thirds of consumers, 62% of people around the world, say they're willing to change their buying habits to reduce environmental impact. Wow. Half of consumers say they're willing to pay more for sustainable products and brands. Now, there's a but. As often happens with consumers, there's a gap between what we say we'll do and what we actually do. And, you know, it's like when you're standing in the grocery store looking at the gallon jugs of milk. You've got the regular milk, and, you know, in my grocery stores, that tends to be 3 or $4 a gallon. And then you've got the, the fancy organic milk, and that can be maybe $5, maybe even $6 a gallon. Now, If you're standing and you're saying, I'm a sustainable consumer, you know, I recycle, I compost, I want to buy sustainably, but gosh, a dollar or two for a gallon of milk? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to make that trade off. That's that intention action gap in action. And, and frankly, it's up to retailers and brands to close this gap. And that's another question we ask consumers. And frankly, for some consumers, there just has to be no trade off. Yeah. I get uh, the, that. The sustainable option has to have the same price, same quality, same selection. However, for a growing number of consumers, and this is a group we call the purpose-driven consumers, 
who choose products and brands primarily based on how well those products and brands align with their mm-hmm. own personal beliefs and values, what can make the difference is information. How, how and where the products are made, how, where they were sourced, mm-hmm. what makes them sustainable. Our listeners can read this study at ibm.com slash IBV. That's I as in Ingrid, B as in Bob, V as in Victoria. Last question, Carl. We are chatting with Carl Howler, who leads IBM's Consumer Industry Center of Competency. How are retailers changing the consumer experience? And that includes, obviously, some supply chain challenges. And what is the role of technology in this transformation? One of the things we've seen in the last two years especially is um, a great acceleration in all sorts of activities, supply chain, customer experience, you know, kind of back office operations, and technology. If I had to boil it down to one word, the role of technology is ginormous. You know, and we've been in a technology-centric mindset for the past 10 or 20 years, and I think we're still at the early stages. You know, over the next five years, Things that are futuristic now and, and have only been emerging in the, you know, since 2015, 2016, things like artificial intelligence or AI, things like augmented reality and virtual reality, blockchain, 5G, IoT or Internet of Things, crypto, hybrid cloud for big companies, big retailers and brands. Those are going to be as common as things like spreadsheet, email, and PowerPoint are today. (laughs) Carl, great to chat with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on. Again, the website is ibm.com slash IBV. If you're on social media, drop by and say hi. It's Mark Saltzman. Mark with a C, -S S A L T Z M A N. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Come by and say hi. Let me know what you think of the show, if you've got suggestions for upcoming guests, and so on. Speaking of guests, when we return, we're going to chat with an actual hacker about what he does and why. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Breaking down geek speak into street speak. Check it out. Hosted by Mark Saltzman. Welcome back to Tech It Out, powered by Asus and its award-winning laptop family. There's the ZenBooks, VivoBooks, StudioBooks, ExpertBooks, and Chromebooks, all of which can be seen at asus.com slash us slash radio. And Asus is spelled A-S-U-S dot com. Speaking of computers, when you think of a hacker, it's probably a negative thing, a bad thing. But have you heard of a white hat hacker or an ethical hacker? Well, it may change your perception of what a hacker hacker is, what they do, and why they do what they do. And so joining us on the line to chat is Ben Sadegapur. He's head of hacker education at Hacker One. That's his day gig, and he's a hacker and content creator off hours as well. Welcome to the show, Ben. Good to chat with you, and happy 2022 to you. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me. Happy 2022 to you. Thank you. Now, before we talk about Hacker One, please tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, um, I'm Ben Sadegapur. Most people online know me as Nahamsek. I'm a content creator, hacker, educator, public speaker, whatever title you can give me with someone that just likes the idea of hacking. And I want to pretty much spread hacking and the the good that comes out of hacking, the things that people have accomplished from hacking, people like myself and my friends through what I do. Mm -hmm. And I've been in bug bounty since 2014. I wasn't doing it very seriously, but it was a hobby that turned into a full-time gig and then it turned out to a full-time job and it's a corporate job eventually. (laughs) That's awesome. Bug bounties. I'm going to ask you to clarify that in a moment, but I think I understand. And, And this is what I wanted to bring you on to the show to chat about is is what a hacker is exactly and some of the good that they do because i think that's often uh, misunderstood or even ignored uh, in mainstream media so for the record what is a hacker when someone says to me hey my facebook account got hacked i don't know if they really know what hacking is because it's usually not the case yeah, hacking, it depends on who you talk to. It could be hacking in games is different. Hacking in social media is different. Hacking and coding is different. But generally, hacker is someone that could think outside of the box and um, come up with very creative ways to overcome obstacles. So for my case as a hacker is I look at a website, a product, an application, you know, anything that I can use or people use and figuring out what is it supposed to do and what is it not supposed to do and exactly do they think that it's not supposed to do? 
So in a case of an application is supposed to protect people's private information, it's not supposed to leak it. I find a way to leak that information, obtain access to it in a very ethical way and disclosing it to the company and giving them a way to fix it, pretty much mm-hmm. advising them to so fix it. So in other issue. words, you're hired to try to find vulnerabilities and exploit them from a company, whether it's their website or a service or an app or something like that. Your goal is to try to break it, right? And see if you can. That's exactly it. So the hackers, we try to tell everybody we are hackers. It's the ethical hacking, white hat hacker, all the same. The whole objective is for us to think very similarly as a malicious hacker or what we like to call Mm -hmm. cyber criminals Mm -hmm. instead of hackers. And do the same things, but our intents are different. The intention for us is to secure the internet, for some people is to just uh, help build you know more secure software websites whatever that they're using some people do it for monetary purposes some people do it for the greater good because they want to make a difference in the world uh, versus the cyber criminals are doing it just to you know make money from it by selling that data to other third party uh, people companies organizations and so on yeah i've often written articles about why hackers exist and i do mean the malicious types it's usually for financial gain but there's other motivating factors it could be for political reasons Reasons. It could be a disgruntled, you know, ex-employee that's trying to get back at the company to try to embarrass them, you know, by leaking their mm-hmm. customer information and all that. Or it could be for bragging rights. Well, why'd you climb the mountain? Because it was there. And then also to brag, you know, I don't know if it's like dark web or what have you, but you gain cred among your peers that you took down the likes of a, a Yahoo or a whatever. Interestingly, you're on the positive side where you're brought on and you, you, you explain that a white hat hacker and an ethical hacker are more or less the same thing. I use those terms interchangeably. But your goal is to purposely break into a company's system to expose vulnerabilities. And that's to help them eventually, which is pretty neat. Yeah, and it's pretty similar to, right? A lot of the hackers that I've worked with, uh, including myself, the bragging rights is still a thing for us too. Sure. You know, who doesn't yeah. want to say I have hacked into Apple, I've hacked into Google. Right. So a lot of it is applicable. It's just the the ultimate goal, what it is, you know, mm-hmm. ours is just to secure things versus for the cyber criminals or the hackers of malicious yeah. intent is to, you know, create fear or political gain or whatever that is. Yeah. Thanks for that. Before we talk about your work with Hacker One, what do you use to hack into a system of some sort? I mean, is it software that you are finding on the dark web or that you've created? Like, what, can you maybe just as a layman here, can you just walk us through like what the tools are that you use to do your thing honestly there there's three things that are very very basic things and they're not even tools i need coffee wi-fi and a working laptop in a lot of cases <laughs> those are usually what you're, you're i think you're oversimplifying what you do but yeah <laughs> there are tools that are um, that are being used but you don't the tools are not really there to do the job for a lot of the hackers that have been doing this for a while it's just to facilitate things yeah. right can you browse the web without a browser sure but the browser is that to make it easier right mm. so we use uh Proxying tools, which uh, it's one of the examples, it's Portswigger uh, has this tool called Burp Suite. And Burp Suite is just a suite of tools that allows you to intercept whatever you interact with your browser. So when you click on a link on your browser, mm-hmm. Burp Suite inter- uh, interacts with it, catches that, intercepts it, and it shows you what information you're sending to the website from your browser to the web server and what you receive back. Wow. So you can see all the information that's being sent back and forth. And as a hacker, what we do is we examine every single bit of information that's being sent. We look at it. How is it being sent? What kind of data is it being sent to this web server or this website? What happens if we change some of the characters? What happens if we add extra characters, symbols? We look at the behavior of the website once that data has been modified. Hmm. That's the easiest way to put it. There are other tools for different attacks that you can use, but honestly, a lot of the hackers either don't use them or they use them as a last resort. Fascinating. We'll continue chatting with Nahamsek, an ethical hacker, when we return on Tech It Out. Follow Mark Saltzman on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Listen to Tech It Out whenever you want. We are chatting with Ben Sadegapur. He's the head of hacker education at Hacker One, which we're now going to learn about. He's also a hacker and content creator, a public speaker, podcaster. And your handle, if you will, is it Namsek? Yes, it's Nahamsek. There's no real meaning behind it. It was just me being very young and I <laughs> uh, wanted to find a name for myself. Yeah. And that's the best I could come up awesome. with. Well, if you're on Twitter, <laughs> you can follow him at the at sign N-A-H-A-M-S-E-C. So without further ado, tell us about Hacker One. What is the organization all about? And talk to us about your work with them. 
Yeah, HackerOne is a bug bounty platform. We are a hacker power security. We provide bug bounty, pen testing, and uh, anything that comes into security, a company's assets and web applications. All right, so pen testing is penetration testing, and that goes back to being a white hat hacker or an ethical hacker, right? Correct. Okay, just just breaking it down. And bug bounty. It's a concept that a company comes out and says, hey, we have these products, we have these assets, we have these services that we provide, and we're going to put a bounty on it. And if you hack into our product, if you can tell us there's vulnerabilities, based on what you have found, we offer a range of monetary reward. That reward could be anywhere from 50 to $100. I think our minimum right now is $100, and it's gone all the way to, I want to say, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's wow. incredible to see some of these companies paying that amount out to the hackers. Is it unusual, Ben, for a hacker to do such a good job for an organization like this to, to be hired eventually by a big tech company that wants you to work for them? It is very common. It's way more common than you think. Mm-hmm. Um, I can name a few of my own hacker friends that have done bug bounties including myself also, that we've been hired by companies because of our relationships, because of our networking, yeah. because of the work that we have done. Or it doesn't even have to be one vulnerability. It's a consistency of work that I've done with this company. Mm-hmm. The company has come back and said, hey, would you like to come and work for us? Would you like to come and work with us and help us secure our infrastructure and run so our bug bounty program? Awesome. And you're not considered a sellout if you do it. If it's a good payday, why not? <laughs> I mean, in some cases, it's guaranteed money, right? Yeah, you're already sure. doing this for it. And with bug bounties, it's not a guaranteed money. You're, you're, you're making a lot of money while doing this, but it's not always guaranteed. You're going to have mm-hmm. you know, a week when you don't make any money, and the next week you may make 3000 5000 30000 Who knows, right? Yeah, I get it. Yeah, almost like a freelancer. All right, Ben, before we wrap up, let's hear about your findings from the Hacker Powered Security Report. So the Hacker Powered Security Report is something that we put out every year done it for years. I can't even say how many years it's been since we've done it. Uh, But this year, we have seen that vulnerabilities have increased by 20% in 2021. Uh, Hackers have reported over 66,000 valid vulnerabilities to the organizations that work with HackerOne. The the report is online. If you go to HackerOne.com slash HackerPowerSecurityReport, there's a webinar attached to it. But it pretty much breaks down what we have done in the current year and what has increased in the previous year, if that Mm. makes sense. I'd ask you to what you attribute this increase, but it's probably tied to the pandemic and more people working from home, right? Added uh, vulnerabilities there. It could be both, to be honest. But every year, even before the pandemic, that we've always seen an increase in vulnerabilities Mm. just Mm -hmm. because companies are growing very, very quickly. They're, you know, they're creating more functionalities, more services, more products. So as they grow, there's more room for error and those hackers are prone to find them faster and faster. So the industry has grown over the years it's grown way more than it did the year before. So it could be a combination of both. I think COVID definitely had a part in it, but I think that um, the vulnerabilities we have found, the bounty amounts, the number of vulnerabilities would have still increased because of how fast this industry is growing. All right. Awesome. Ben, really interesting chatting with you. I think it's fascinating. HackerOne.com is the best website. We've been chatting with Ben Sadegapur or Namsek. So thank you so much uh, for carving out time to chat. I'm wishing you a fantastic 2022. Thanks. Thanks for having me again and you too. Speaking of computers and as a smart means of defense against malicious hackers, not ethical or white hat hackers like Nahamsek, don't forget to properly back up your important files on a regular basis just in case you are a victim of an attack. It's really easy to do so. I would pick up a Western Digital or SanDisk drive, have it always connected to your laptop or desktop. And if you don't want to manually remember to drag and drop over your important files on a regular basis, there's free software at Western Digital's website that you can download that will automatically back up, you know, say in the middle of the night when you're not using your computer and you don't want it to impact performance at like, I don't know, three in the morning, have your important files back up both locally to an external drive that you can trust over time, as well as to the cloud. There's lots of free services that will give you usually at least five gigabytes, which is enough for files and and several photos. But if you're a digital pack rat, you like to download videos and music and other big files and you're going to need more storage. But definitely trust WD and SanDisk as I do and I prefer myself solid state or SSD drives instead of a hard drive when it comes to speed and performance and durability and so on. Head over to westerndigital.com or sandisk.com to learn more. 
I hope you enjoyed this week's new Tech It Out show. I hope to see you on social media. Let me know what you think. Again, it's Mark Saltzman. Mark with a C, Saltzman with a Z. I write a tech tip of the day. I link to the articles that I write for USA Today and Costco and AARP. I answer your tech questions. There's giveaways and more. Wishing you a fantastic week ahead, a healthy one. And I look forward to catching up with you next weekend for another episode of Tech It Out on the Radio America Network. Take care, everyone. Be well. Ciao.